Uh, okay, still a little bit early, um, but uh, yeah, okay, we've got everybody here though, so uh, maybe I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my my audio is still on, right? Still working here. All right, thanks. Um, okay, so reminders. Um, so yeah, I mean, first of all, this is kind of a, a shortened week, but that's the way it always is for these five week summer sessions. For some reason, it's really not completely five weeks. So we're actually done on Thursday. Um, I have to submit like grades like the next day after that. So I really can't look at anything that comes in after Thursday. Um, so, I mean, that, that does mean, so just, you know, be aware that you do have to do both the programming, well, all, all three of our last, um, <clears throat> Um, assignments here. So you have to do the problem set uh, that's due tomorrow or um, uh, uh, due today. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the program assignment is due on Thursday as usual, but uh, the fifth test I, I'm opening up starting tomorrow. Um, so, you know, I know the way most people work, you might want to do the test uh, a bit, uh, get it out of the way so you can concentrate on the program assignment, uh, but whichever works best for you, but make certain that everybody's aware of uh, and gets everything uh, in by Thursday. So, any questions about that? Um, so, uh, let me real quickly just uh, kind of review the, the the last question on uh, on on the test four that we just did. Um, I wanted to you know just mention this. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it would be good to make certain that you understand the, the, the clock page replacement algorithm, uh, what we did here for this third question. Um, I, I, as I said, in kind of our lecture videos, I believe, I mean, the, the actual page replacement that's used by most operating system is some version of clock, uh, like is described here. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, or and even more so, this version for the test question uh, uh, is is more realistic than uh, a lot of the simpler ones that we do in the chapter uh, nine because we use both the uh, the a use bit and uh, a modify bit or um, a dirty bit uh, here in this modified um, algorithm uh, for the clock. So. Um, but it works kind of the same way, except except we're taking into account both the use bit and the modify bit, right? So, you know, given this is the state of memory and this was the problem that was given to you on this test um, where we had these values for the use bits and these values for the modify bits. Um, so you have to know both uh, which page is referenced um, and whether it was referenced as a read or a write, because uh, that, that changes certain things. So, um, in this particular case, you know, uh, the, you, you always start off um, for all these page replacement algorithms. The question is, is it a hit or a miss? So in this case, three is not in memory as it starts. So that's a, a miss or a page fault, all right? It's not page fail, it's page fault. So, um, <clears throat> so in this case, if we follow the algorithm, the, 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 this is the simplest of the, the, the you can potentially have to go through four separate steps, but the first thing you do is you just scan, not change any use bits or modify bits. Um, if, you, if you find something with a use bit of zero or a modify bit of zero, you'll select it for replacement, right? So, so that was what was supposed to happen on this very first one because there's one thing in memory that hadn't been used recently and hadn't been modified. Okay, so why you know why do we want to um, take into account whether a page is modified or not? Well, it's pages that haven't been modified, we don't have to write them back out to memory. So uh, we only have to load the page three, read it from disk. You know, so if it's modified, we have to write it back out to secondary storage. Um, and, and anytime you're reading or writing to secondary storage, uh, which is typically going to be your hard drive, I mean, that takes a lot of time. So by modifying the clock to use the modify bit or the dirty bit, uh, we, we prefer to select things that aren't modified. Therefore, we only have to do one transfer from disk instead of two, right? So if, if it's if it is if we select a page that's modified, we have to do one transfer to first write it back out to secondary storage, and then we do another transfer to read 
the page that was faulting into the selected frame. Um, so that, that's the reasoning behind this. And, and typically real operating systems are going to use some sort of a modif modified clock just like this. So it will take into account both the, the, the modify status of the page and um, some use bit or maybe multiple use bits of information about how recently the page has been used. So, so um, you know, uh, to me, you know, again, this is complex enough. Uh, I should probably check, double check over this. Hopefully this, this example solution is correct here. But, uh, but yeah, after the first fault, uh, we kick out page five and replace it with three. So the other thing you have to do correctly, I mean, the, the uh, uh, frame pointer should be pointing to the frame after the one that you just replaced, because that's where we want to start the next scan, like you should have done on when you implemented your clock policy um, on assignment four last week. Um, but the other thing is that you have to, uh, uh, as usual, the use bits should always be one when you uh, load in the page, but you have to set the modify bit depending on whether it was a read or a write. So since this was a write, uh, we actually are um, getting the page, whatever its, its status was, assigning it a frame, and then we're, we're, we're writing some change, making some modifications. So it's going to be dirty or modified. So the modified bit should be set to one, right? Otherwise, you know, all the other use bits and modify bits should not have changed as a result of that scan there. Uh, and then the second reference um, for page five is also a page fault because um, page five is currently not in memory. We've got pages one, six, three, and four. So we're going to the scan. We don't, the, the first scan fails. There's no use zero uh, um, modify zeros now. So it would wrap around and then we have to do step uh, two um, or step B here. Um, so here we want to scan looking for a, a frame with use zero modify one starting here. So actually the frame that we start off has exactly what we need. So um, again, this was slightly simple or it should have been, you know, if you're doing this correctly, um, we don't actually end up scanning anything. So we don't end up uh, flipping. If, if the first frame that we looked at didn't have a use of zero and a modify of one, we would have gone to the next page, but flipped the, the, the use bit from uh, one to zero. Right. So, so during the scan, we are, are flipping the use bits. So, but in this case, the, the very first frame that we check uh, matches for step B. So we would kick out four and replace it with five. And this is a read. So when it comes in, its use bit should be set to one. But uh, since it's read, the page is not dirty yet. So it's modified bit is still zero. Uh, but otherwise, all the other use bits and modified bits should have remained the same. Um, and our frame pointer should be back to frame one since we just replaced the last frame four in memory. So we wrap back around. Um, and then next we have a uh, an actual hit. Um, so um, page one is in memory here, the page that's referenced. So the only thing that you do for a hit, like on the clock policy that you guys should have done, uh, learned about for the program assignment, um, is that um, uh, we should set the use bit to one, although it was already one, so nothing happened there. Uh, oh, but yeah, the other thing for the modified, then, um, um, if it is a right, uh, the, the modified bit should also be set to one. So a bit did change here, uh, even though it was a hit, um, the page has become dirty or modified now. Uh, and then the last one is the most difficult. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, um, uh, we have a reference to page four, a right on page four. Um, that is a fault. Um, page four is not currently in memory. So our initial scan for zero, zero won't find anything. So we'll back up here. Then we'll be scanning for zero, one, flipping all the use bits. But again, we won't find anything for step B. Uh, so the only result of the step B scan is all the use bits get set to zero here. Um, and then uh, step uh, C and D or three and four is to repeat uh, A and B. Um, but, you know, since we flipped the use bit, we're guaranteed that at least one page has a use bit of, uh, you know, either one page somewhere has to have a use bit of zero and a modify of one or maybe a zero zero as well. But, but yeah, since we uh, just flipped all these use bits, we're back to frame one, but all the use bits are zero, but we don't have any zero zeros 
Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so since we flipped all these use bits, we're actually going to stop at step three. So we've got a use bit of zero and a modified bit of zero. So when we scan there for a zero, zero, a repeat of step one, uh, we're going to find the frame four, kick out page five and replace it uh, with four. So the frame pointer comes up to here. All these use bits got flipped to zero as a re result of the second step there, second scan. Uh, and when page four came in, uh, it's use bit was set to one. Since it was a write, it's modified bit was set to one. All right. All right. Um, so yeah, that, that was all I kind of wanted to talk about. But but you know, this is a good thing to understand. Like, like I said, this is typical of what actual page replacements in uh, modern operating systems are going to be doing something like this, like a modified clock here. All right. Anybody have a question about that or want to ask about any of the other things? Most of the other things were mostly fine. A few problems um, on one or two of the um, uh, first question. But Um, all right, so if not, uh, let's do kind of the usual. So I'll, um, I'll spend, talk a little bit about the problem set that's due today um, that hopefully, you know, you're working on or have already worked on. Um, and then we'll get started on the assignment. Uh, I don't have a lot to say about um, the problem set. Um, so it's relatively straightforward. Uh, you're supposed to take... So, so um, our material this week is about job scheduling. So it's another important aspect of operating systems, how you, how the dispatcher um, at the lowest level makes decisions about which job to run next. Um, all right. So, you know, our textbook talks about uh, 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 quite a few uh, different process schedulers. I talked about it in our lecture video. Uh, first come, first serve, um, Robin schedulers, um, shortest process next, shortest remain time, um, highest response ratio next, and feedback. Um, I, I only asked you to do four here, although I would encourage you, um, I mean, to go ahead and do um, um, uh, an HRRN and a feedback scheduler. I mean, you might see those on the final test five. Uh, but in any case, you should understand all of those different um, job scheduling um, policies uh, from our chapter nine. So, um, so what I'm looking for here, I mean, you can, uh, I, I want something, I want both kind of like the a table 9.5 um, uh, showing the, the timing of the, the resulting schedule. Uh, and also kind of an analysis of the turnaround time and stuff. So um, I don't have my textbook up, but let me open up the textbook here um, and show what I mean real quickly. Uh, where's my textbook? Uh, there it is. <clears throat> So um, I'm kind of looking for like this, and so, so the figure out five and table. Except you don't have to. You don't have to make a, 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 a Gantt chart like this if you don't want to. So to save time, um, if it's easier, um, you can. Uh, you can just give me a, a simple schedule, um, like um, you know, like if A runs twice and then B runs twice and then we're back to A, like if we're doing a round robin scheduler and then maybe C runs, you know, something like that. Uh, so that's sufficient um, um, and maybe, you know, quicker than giving out like a full kind of Gantt chart. I mean, you know, that's this, like, like for example, for round robin, a, an equivalent uh, representation is A, A, B, A, B, C, B, you know, just, just the sequence of, uh, each process running here, okay? Uh, but do give me both that and um, <clears throat> and also calculate the, um, the the turnaround time and the, um, the 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 ratio of the turnaround time to the um, service time um, for each process. Have it 
calculate it's you know so to get this right you have to correctly schedule get the schedule correct for each one i asked you for so you have to find out you, you know the arrival times from this you have to figure out the finish time for each process that will tell you the turnaround time which is the difference between the arrival and the finish um and then from the turnaround time you can calculate this ratio of turnaround time to total time or to service time um, and then, yeah, you can calculate the average turnaround time and the average um, uh, ratio if you want to. So, so these are measures, if, if you read through the material, these are measures of how well um, the scheduling algorithms work for that particular set of jobs, uh, arrivals and, and um, sizes and things. So, all right. But I do need both of those, um, you know, so, so um, the actual schedule and, and, and calculate um, those things. Uh, turnaround time and uh, uh, the the ratio. Uh, and like I said, um, you know, I asked for a first come first serve, a round robin with the time quantum of four, I think. Uh, yeah, round robin with, with a time quantum of four uh, and the shortest process next and the shortest remaining time. So I didn't ask for like a, the, the, the last two basically, but uh, the feedback scheduler might be a little bit more complex. So HRRN, uh, highest response ratio next, um, shouldn't be too difficult. So, so you might want to, just to make certain that you understand these, do those um, uh, as well. So. Um, although, you know, right. So the only, the only difference between is, is this is a different set of jobs uh, and arrival times and processing times. So, so, but it's doing the same thing as the textbook, but uh, with this set of, of jobs here. Um, all right, so yeah, it may kind of need any clarifications for the problem set uh, that you should be working on here. One, one hint, uh, I, I, thinking about when I get people, you know, um, these schedulers, uh, the, the most common problem, I mean, round robin is probably the most complex of, of these. Uh, you have to keep track of, you know, what the time slice quantum is. Um, and, um, um, you know, like, like if we have a round robin of four, um, you know, uh, if, if the process, once it's done its quantum, this is, you know, basically the, this is the same thing as what we implemented for the second programming assignment with our uh, um, uh, process, um, uh, the simulation of the process uh, control block, the process table and things. Uh, we were basically implementing a round robin scheduler in that, right? So um, a common thing here though, I mean, keep do your queue correctly. So, you know, uh, if, if, a, if a process gets preempted, just go to the back of the queue. Um, um, another thing is if, if you wanna get these exactly the same as what the textbook would do, um, you do have to worry about, um, um, so it's possible that, you know, at time, um, uh, so, so you'll see it for a time slice of quantum of one here. So basically here uh, at time two, uh, process A was preempted and process B arrived at time two. So notice the the, so this doesn't happen in like real operating systems. You, you, you really can't have things that happen exactly at the same time. But when you simulate this, you, you've got something being preempted at time two at the very exact same time something arrives. So um, the way our textbook shows this is that you should put the arriving process on the queue first and then put the preempted, any preempted process should go uh, second on the queue. So that's why B runs as soon as it arrives because B got added to the queue on arrival um, and then A was preempted and put uh, uh, to the back of the ready queue. So it's behind B at that point. Uh, and so then when the dispatcher runs, uh, B is at the front um, and it dispatches B to run one time slice quantum. So, so anyway, it's, it's very common for people to, uh, a common mistake on, on round robin is to not be handling the ready queue correctly. Um, 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 so when something's preempted, you need to make sure it goes to the back of the ready queue behind anything that's already there. So, and, and you should try and break ties the same way the textbook does. So if things happen simultaneously, you first process arriving things, then you process things being preempted.
All right. Uh, yeah. So I asked before any questions about the the fifth problem set here. If not, I said this this um, this, this uh, help session might be relatively quick, but let's go as usual. We'll get started on assignment five. I, I mean, you know, again. You're going to be, you don't have as much time as usual. Um, I am planning on meeting on Thursday face to face as usual. So I'll be in the classroom, uh, do a last thing, can talk about assignment five uh, and or the test. So, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, you should try to get started on things early, especially the program assignment. Uh, so if you haven't already started on it, uh, you might really want to get started on it today. So, um, We are going to be implementing a simulation of a process scheduler. This has the same structure um, in terms of the uh, the, the project, um, like in our previous one. Let me open up the um, let's open up the assignment five here. So um, we've kind of got that same structure that we just had for uh, our, our previous assignment four, in in the sense that in this simulation we've got. Um, one class called the scheduling system, that is the one that's responsible for the overall simulation. But then we've got an object-oriented hierarchy of helper classes that implement policies. So we've got a scheduling policy that acts as a base class, uh, the, the same as our um, um, page replacement policy uh, for the previous assignment four. So the, the base class is just defining an interface of things that scheduling policies need to be able to do. Um, so in this case, um, we, um, you know, have to know when new processes are created. Um, uh, the, the main function is the dispatch. So whenever the CPU becomes idle, the dispatch gets called on the scheduling policy to, to figure out which process should be next be selected to run next, right? Um, and some scheduling policies are preemptive, some are not. So for preemptive scheduling policies, um, um, we get called like every clock cycle asking whether we should preempt the current process or not. So for like a round robin that's preemptive uh, on a time slash quantum of four, um, um, uh, we have to return true every time the, the current running process is supposed to be preempted and false uh, when it's not time to preempt it yet. So. All right. And then uh, in this assignment, um, there's a full working first come first serve, kind of like there was a full FIFO last time, although there's no like a stub um, um, second policy. Right. So I'll talk about that a, a little bit here. But basically. Um, Uh, I thought I had the uh, assignment description open here. Let me open that again just real quickly. Um, so let me get the assignment five um, description back up here. Must have accidentally closed it. So um, like the previous assignment, I mean, the first um, four tasks are implementing member methods in the basic um, simulator for, for you know, the basic uh, process scheduling system simulator. Uh, then the second one, um, Once you have those four tasks done, um, um, you next have to implement um, another scheduling policy. So like, like you implemented clock before, uh, you have to implement another scheduling policy, but I leave it up to you to pick something, right? So, so it can't be first come first serve, we already have that, uh, but you know you can implement um, um, a round robin scheduling, scheduling policy or source process next or so on, right? 
But uh, I'll show you. So since I didn't give you kind of the starting code, you'll have to start by copying the first come first serve files uh, and doing a little bit of renaming uh, to get you started on things. All right. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the first task is to implement uh, a couple of missing um, uh, member methods for the scheduling system. So the get system time, get them processes. Um, so, so So if we look at the uh, the tests here real quickly, um, so one of them is like to to get the the system time and return it. Uh, get number of processes, is CPU idle, um, all those kinds of things. So um, these should all be member methods in the scheduling system. So, so the first four tasks are, are doing things in scheduling system. So, you know, again, some people didn't get this on the last time. Um, so I, I consider this kind of a, a simple thing, you know, so most of these for the first task is there's member variables like the, um, uh, not, not the process, there's member variables of the scheduling system, like um, what the current system time is in our simulation, um, what the number total number of processes are that are being run in this, managed in the simulation, um, some other things, right? So for most of those, you're just returning back what the, the, the member variable is. They're, they're, they're what are known as getter methods or, or accessor methods. Um, so, for example, the um, the system time is just implemented as um, a step function that's always returning zero, but you really need to return um, the um, actual what the actual current um, system time is uh, here, which is um, just um, a member variable. Right. Um, and um, let's see, is there anything? Um, um, Get number of processes should be um, a um, um, you know a simple one. The other two would be a little bit more complex. Um, so somebody's asked just asked a question here. Sorry, I didn't see that. So so yeah, you have to choose one. Um, um, so um, yeah, I, I might not. I, I I'm probably going to add some tests. Uh, I might only be testing. Uh, yeah, I've only got some tests in there for round robin or short process next up, but no, you can do short for main time or something like, like that. If somebody does that, I might add some other system tests for those. So, so it's fine to pick any, any kind of policy that you might want to, but yeah, there are some existing uh, tests for um, some round robin with some different time slice quantums and like a short process next implementation. So. Um, All right. So the the besides the two getter methods, uh, the others will be a little bit more, maybe a little bit more difficult for task one. So like is CPU idle? You have to check uh, whether the 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 CPU has the idle um, um, process ID or not. So basically, you know, again to remind you, this is similar to uh, what we were doing for the second program assignment. Um, although here, you know, I did it for you instead of kind of um, letting you decide how to do it as you did in assignment two so in this simulation there's a member variable called cpu which keeps the identifier 
of the process that's currently running, right? Uh, and this will be um, a special, you know, this will be um, set to um, idle whenever the CPU is idle. So uh, to um, to determine if the CPU is idle or not, um, uh, all you have to do is check if that CPU is equal to the uh, you know idle um, uh, definition, right? So so if it's idle, then you want to return true. If it's not idle, you want to return false, right? Um, and then. Uh, then the last one you have to do for task one is to return the, the running process name. Okay, so to do that, you have to look it up. So again, in the, uh, the, the CPU member variable, um, uh, you can use that as an index. So if the CPU isn't idle, this will be an index into the process table here, right? So, um, you know, so if the current running process is has an ID of one, you could look up, uh, um, uh, this ends up being an array of process objects. So you can dereference this array to get um, um, uh, process one, and then the particular member field that you need um, is the name. So, so you need to return that, right? So, you know, again, if the, um, uh, if, if, the, if the CPU is idle, you should return uh, the, uh, a string idle. Otherwise, if it's not idle, you need to look it up in your process table, which is just a straightforward array here, um, and, and get the name as a member variable um, from a process object or process instance. Okay. All right. So, um, So after that, you know, the, the, the other tasks are to implement some other member functions. Um, these, are, these have some similarity to what you should have done for the previous assignment, although um, some people didn't quite get that far. But, um, you know, so task two is to implement this all processes done, which basically you need to check through all the processes in the process table and, um, um, you know, again, you know, a process, uh, whenever it finishes, is going to be uh, the boolean done is going to be set to be true. So, so initially, when processes are first loaded into the simulation, uh, done will be false. Um, and then, as we're running, once we detect that a process finishes, uh, the, it, uh, this boolean flag gets set to true. Um, uh, uh, that is finished. So, to, to check if all processes are done or not, you look through all the processes in the process table. Uh, if you find any process that's not yet done, you return false. Um, and if, if you find all the processes are done, then you, you return true um, from that one. Um, so um, then you have to implement the dispatch CPU if idle. Uh, so basically this one um, is, you know, you first check if the CPU is idle or not, you should reuse the is CPU idle function that you did from task one. And, and, and if it is idle, you need to call the dispatch um, method on the, the, the policy, um, the, the, um, uh, the, the scheduling policy that you've got, right? So that, that was one of the things um, that were, were in there. Um, and then like the fourth task is um, 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 to actually do the thing to check if a process is finished or not. So you can detect if a process is finished or not. Um, so if, if the CPU is not idle, um, you look at the, the process that is currently running and, it, it, and then you look at the service time in there. So if, um, if uh, compare the time use of the service time. So again, for these process objects, um, you know, as the simulation is running things, the service time is one of the properties of the process when you load the processes for the simulation. So you know that we have a total time or a service time of five. Uh, but every cycle that a process uh, runs, the time used will get incremented and it'll be initialized to zero. So to, to check if the processes are done, you have to see if the time used is equal to the service time, equal to or greater, I guess. But 
time. You should stop as soon as it's equal to the service time there. Um, when the process is finished, you have to do a couple of things, including um, um, setting that done variable for the process to be true. So, so you know, this is this is where that actually happens, so that the um, um, all processes done can do the work correctly or not. Um, but we also record the end time. So, so the uh, uh, the time when the process actually finished, if it is finished now, um, and set the CPU back to be idle if the process needs to be finished off. So, um, all right, and then, like I said, I, I didn't kind of want to get you started um, on the second part here. So you do have to implement uh, some other scheduling policy. So to do that, this time, since I didn't give you kind of a running start, what you should do is something like this. So I, I suggest, let's say we want to implement Shores Process Next. So you want to make a copy of um, the, the scheduling policy that you're given and then do a global name replace from, you know, the first come first serve to the policy that you're trying to implement. So I can like, like for example, right click on this and, um, um, do like a copy, and then uh, you have to be a little bit careful. But but yeah, if I just do a Control V or a paste, um, it'll 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 paste it in there and give that kind of name as lots of things do when there's a a duplicate name. But then you can right click on that and rename it to like uh, Source Process Next. We're trying to do Source Process Next, um, and we want to do the same thing for um, the, the 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 implementation file, so we'll make a copy of that. And do our source process next. Okay. Um, now you know. So since I copied those, I mean, it's it's really still got first come first serve. So you need to go in and change all first come first serve to. Um, SPN for source process next, right? So so you probably want to use the. Um, um, uh, the, the find and replace, so control F in Visual Studio Code will bring up find and then you can do a find search and replace basically here. So um, I you know, do need to be careful that you don't mess things up. So I would usually do it the full name to, to change all first come first serve scheduling policies to um, SPN here, uh, and then check these one by one. So, um, so here when you have it highlighted, um, you can replace what's currently on there using these buttons here. So yeah, there's replace all or replace one at a time. Uh, but the other thing is, though, uh, this didn't get everything because um, you also need to make certain you change the uh, the if def uh, header uh, guards here. Um, but uh, but yes, go ahead and find these and replace them. And that's it in this file. Um, although, like I said, you know, uh, we do need to also change this. And we'll get those. Okay, so that was the header file. Um, and then, I mean, you know, really, you should go through and. Um, uh, check your documentation and stuff. You know, always try to keep your documentation up up to uh, uh, date here. Um, depending on what you're implementing, though, you know, so you, you might not have a ready queue. Um, so so like you might need a ready queue for uh, Ron Robin, but you might not need it for Source Process Next. Although for like Source Process Next or Source Main Time, you do need at least like a list of the processes or something like that. Although you might be able to use the um, um, you might be able to call your um, uh, scheduling system and, and ask it for the information from the uh, directly from the uh, table of processes. So. But I'll go ahead and remove uh, any private variable here for my SPN. Um, 
and we do need to, you know, do pretty, pretty much the same thing for the um, the implementation file as well. So it's important here. because um, uh, because all the classes, uh, since these are member functions of the class, we definitely need to change all those, um, uh, you know, the, the name, the, the, the name that these functions are in um, everywhere here, so. And the other thing, though, you know, um, this, these may or may not be good starting points. So, you know, I'd probably, you know, you, you've got all the code in the first come first serve. So I would probably mostly uh, empty out these functions. Um, although you have to be careful for stub functions, you know, if it's returning a result, that you are returning something. We're stubbing these out. So since uh, dispatch returns your process ID, we'll stub it out just to return idle so we're ready to start implementing it. Um, this is a void function, so we don't have to do anything. All right. So once you've done that, I mean, what your goal is at this point is to get this into the system and building um, and compiling and running the test, right? So the other thing is once you've done this, once you create a file and rename the stuff and you've kind of got stubs that you can do with things, you do need to add it to the build system. So this is, this is I left this in on purpose to maybe get uh, people to learn a little bit about using the build system like make. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, to get it to be, so, so by adding the file there, uh, it's not gonna actually build anything. Um, so, you know, if I do a, do a make, uh, you know, just adding the, the file in the project doesn't add it into the build system. So, you know, if, if, if you look at a build, you know, you'll see that it's, um, uh, um, it's compiling the first one for serve and the scheduling system and the scheduling policy base class. Um, and then that's all doing and linking them together, right? So we really want to get it added into the build system. So there, there's hooks in there kind of showing you where you need to do it. So for example, for source process next, uh, we need to add the HPP and the CP files as sources for the build system. Be careful here that the, the uh, uh, in the in make files, these these variables have to actually be on a one single line. So the, the the backslash here means that we're continuing on on the next line. So uh, if you don't have, you have to have one of those on every line except for the very last one. Uh, and if you don't, um, your your make file will uh, have problems. So we need to add in uh, SPN um, as sources. We need to add then the SPN uh, object file as, as one of the um, object file targets uh, that we need to um, compile again, making certain that every line except the last one um, uh, has one of these line continue things. Uh, and then um, it probably won't hurt anything, but you really should add in, th these are additional prerequisites. So what this is saying in the make file language is that uh, the, the first come first serve object file depends on the source file. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, um, I, I've seen this before, there's a bug here. So it should depend on the source file and the header file. I should fix that, but, uh, but yeah, that's incorrect. And also on the base class header file. So what this means is if I make any modifications to any of these, I need to rebuild the object file because a modification to any one of these three files means potentially that this uh, object file is out of date. So I should rebuild it. That's the way dependencies work on build systems like this. So, um, So I suspect uh, that's also a typo there. So scheduling system should 
depend on the CPP and the HPP and also on scheduling policy header file. Scheduling policy should depend on its CPP and HPP and on the scheduling systems header file since they both have references to each other. Um, Anyway, I think that fixes that. So for a source process next, then um, its object file depends on um, if a change is made to the source file, we need to recompile it. Or if a change is made to the header file, we need to recompile it. Or if a change is made to its base class header file, potentially we should recompile it as well. So. Anyway, so what you want to look for once you've done that, now, if you do a build, um, do a, and it'd be good to do a clean here whenever you're um, making changes to the build system. So I'll do a clean, uh, and then we'll do a build. So the thing to look for, of course, you want to make certain that everything is still compiling uh, and linking together, but you also need to make certain that um, um, you see your new object file um, gets uh, compiled into an object file from your source file um, and also that it gets linked in. So you should see your SPN scheduling policy being linked in to the, the test executable um, and being linked into the SIM executable. All right. Uh, yeah, good point. So somebody's um, uh, giving some other hints uh, for people. So make files can be a bit um, um, uh, picky about syntax, they're a bit crufty, but uh, but really uh, all this in front of things here are actually tabs um, they have to be careful of. Um, um, for some of these things, so. Um, All right, so I think that's enough to get started here. Um, that was all I kind of wanted to, to get through today. Um, so I, once you have that, then, you know, so I, I encourage you to get to that point. Uh, once you have that, then, um, then, then you can uh, actually go ahead and try to think about, you know, what do I need to actually do to implement something like round robin or source process next or whatever you choose in there. So, um, all right, we can talk more about that then on Thursday, see if people need some more details about that or how, how people are doing on, on that last thing. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, by adding that to the sources of the make file, it should the, the, your new class should get put into the submission file. Um, so, I mean, that'd be another good thing to check. So, um, if we open up a terminal, do the normal make, make submit, um, you should see, because we add it to the sources, uh, that your, your file uh, gets added uh, uh, when, when you do the make submit. So, that's in your submission file for grading. Your new, your new scheduling policy, whatever it is. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's sufficient. Uh, all I, uh, it's sufficient to do one more scheduling policy, so uh, of your choice. So, so the first come, first serve should be working if you finish the uh, four tasks uh, for the main simulation. Uh, but then you do have to um, create another simulation to get the full, you know, 100 points on the assignment. So another scheduling policy for the simulation. There's probably some other little things I'm missing. So you might have to add in a little bit of code to the, the uh, assignment five sims, uh, if I remember right, to actually run system tests. Um, but, but yeah, we can talk about those. Um, uh, later but yeah down in here most likely the hooks are in there but uh, they're commented out so you know if, if you specify to run a spn simulation you're gonna have to have a little bit of code like this that actually creates one of those as a policy and then uh, uses that uh, in your scheduling system so. all right uh any other questions uh 
So there's a question about uh, what to do for the preemption. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, so some of these uh, scheduling policies are preemptive and some are not. So the, the, the policy that you're given, the first come first serve um, is non-preemptive. So yeah, as we kind of already saw real quickly, when we copied it over, if you look at its preemptive method, um, it doesn't have to do anything, which is false. Uh, but uh, if you implement like a preemptive mechanism, let's say round robin, um, uh, basically on your preempt method, you're gonna have to check, uh, keep track of the number of time slices in the current quantum that the process has run. Um, and uh, that that you might you might have to change. It might be easiest to add, maybe add things to the um, process object, for example. So so it, it is fine if you need to to, uh, to to implement things easier to like add attributes into scheduling system um, or member variables in the scheduling system. But um, but yeah, you might want to add in you know not only just the time used, but the time slice quantums used or something like that. So, so that might be a place um, that would be useful. Although you could also maybe just add it in as a member variable in your uh, round robin header file uh, that you keep track of the time slice quantum for the current running process only instead of all of them. So there are different, different approaches you could do for that. Um, uh, but anyway, so if, if you are preemptive uh, like, like that, so you have to have some way, like if you're doing round robin, to check uh, if my system time slice quantum is four and the current running process has run four time slices uh, in its current um, dispatch cycle, um, I should return true. Otherwise, I should return false, right? Um, some other policies are preemptive, uh, but they're 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 preemptive on a process arrival. Like shortest remaining time preempts not like on a time slice quantum, but uh, anytime a new process arrives, um, um, you should preempt the current running process and make a scheduling decision again. I, I believe that's what the SRT does, the shortest remaining time. So for that one, um, like, like if you're doing SRT, shortest remaining time. Um, um, Uh, you'll get told when a new process is being started up. So you might want to do something to remember that so that the very next time uh, when you're asked if you preempt or not, you, you return true and then, and then reset that back to false, just as an example for short remaining time, right? So uh, right after every time a, a new process starts, uh, the very next call to preempt should return true um, otherwise, for short remaining time. Otherwise, it normally returns false. All right, that, does that help any or make sense on the preempt method? All right, um, good. So uh, any other questions? Um, If not, I'm going to go ahead and end the session as usual. I'll get this posted, um, although we had everybody for pretty much the full time this time. Um, all right. So keep working on stuff. Send me email questions if you have them. Left the assignment, the problem set, um, and um, I'll see you guys later then.